peace, peace, everyone. Peace. It's your girl, Morgan Renee Myers, coming in for another story time with more of We are still in the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks on Chapter 10. I want to thank everybody that's been tuning in, sharing the video. Um, if you are not subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do so. I should have came with the link ready. Um, I'll tag it, but story time with more of my, or type in the name of this book, and Morgan Myers. It'll come up. You can subscribe to my channel. I have the link posted next time because I record on Facebook and Instagram and download it, upload it to my YouTube. So head over there to catch all of the previous chapters, previous books, and future books to come. I like to focus on highlighting um, bio, what is it, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color, um, authors, and books. This is actually written by a white woman, but she is talking about a black life and this is a story that needs to be told so here we are chapter 10 of the immortal life of henrietta Lacks, the other side of the track clover sits a few rolling hills off route 360 in southern virginia so in the last chapter the, Re the author rebecca had went to henrietta's uh, hometown where her brothers and, and husband still live and was supposed to meet with them but they were ignoring her calls all day so she ran around the city, ran into some, some people from some articles she had read about. And um, when she did finally get in touch with one of the siblings of Henrietta, he basically told her, uh, we ain't telling you nothing. And she was like, well, what about your family and Clover? He was like, you could drive. So here we go. Clover sits a few rolling hills off Route 360 in Southern Virginia, just past Difficult Creek on the banks of the River of Death. My God, Difficult Creek and the banks of the River of Death. Jesus, Lord. I pulled into town under a blue December sky with air warm enough for May and yellow post-it notes with the only information Sonny had given me stuck on my dashboard. They haven't found her grave. Make sure it's day. There are no lights. It gets darker than dark. Ask anybody where Lax Town is. Downtown Clover started at a boarded up gas station with R.I.P. spray painted across its front and ended at an empty lot that once held the depot where Henrietta caught her train to Baltimore. The roof of the old movie theater on Main Street had caved in years ago, its screen landing flat in the field of weeds. The other businesses looked like someone left for lunch decades earlier and never bothered coming back. One wall of Abbott's clothing store was lined with boxes of new red wing work boots stacked to the ceiling and covered in thick dust. Inside his long glass counter beneath an antique cash register lay rows and rows of men's dress shirts, still folded, starch stiff in their plastic. The lounge at Rosie's restaurant was filled with overstuffed chairs, couches, and shag carpet, all in dust-covered browns, oranges, and yellows. A sign in the front window said open seven days, just above one that said closed. At Gregory and Martin, and Mar at Gregory and Martin Supermarket, half-full shopping carts rested in the aisles next to decades-old canned foods, and the wall clock hadn't moved since 6.34 since Martin closed up shop to become an undertaker sometime in the 80s. Even with kids on drugs and the older generation dying off, Clover didn't have enough deaths to keep an undertaker in business. In 1974, it had a population of 227. Wow, that's it. In 1998, it was 198. About 20 years, 24 years later. What? It had dropped. Okay, that same year, Clover lost its town character. It did still have several churches and a few beauty parlors, but they were rarely open. The only steady business left downtown was the one-room one brick post office, but it was closed when I got there. Main Street felt like a place where you could sit for hours without seeing a pedestrian or a car, but a man stood in front of Rosie's, leaning against his red motorized bicycle, waiting to wave at any cars that might pass. He was a short, round, white man with red cheeks who could have been anywhere from 50 to 70. Locals called him the greeter, and he spent most of his life on that corner waving at anyone who drove by, his face expressionless. I asked if he could direct me to Laxtown, where I planned to look for mailboxes with the name Lax on them, then knock on doors asking about Henrietta. The man never said a word, just waved at me, then slowly pointed behind him, across the track. The dividing line between Laxtown and the rest of Clover was stark. On one side of the two-lane road from downtown, there were vast, well-manicured rolling hills, acres and acres of wide open property with horses, a small pond, a well-kept house set back from the road, a minivan, and a white picket fence. Directly across the street, 
stood a small one-room shack about seven feet wide and 12 feet long. It was made of unpainted wood with large gaps between the wall boards where vines and weeds grew. That shack was the beginning of Laxtown, a single roll but a mile long and lined with dozens of houses, some painted bright yellow or green, others unpainted, half caved in or nearly burnt down. Slave era cabins sat next to cinder block homes and trailers, some with satellite dishes and porch swings, others rusted and half buried. I drove the length of Laxtown Road again and again, past the interstate maintenance sign where the road turned to gravel, past a tobacco field with a basketball court in it, just a patch of red dirt and a bare hoop attached to the top of a weathered tree trunk. The muffler on my beat-up black Honda had fallen off somewhere between Pittsburgh and Clover, which meant everyone in Laxtown heard each time I passed. They walked on the porches and peered through windows as I drove by. Finally, on my third or fourth pass, a man who looked like he was in his 70s shuffled out of a green two-room wooden cabin wearing a bright green sweater, a matching scarf, and a black driving cap. He waved a stiff arm at me, eyebrows raised. You lost? He yelled over my muffler. I rolled down my window and I said, not exactly. Well, where are you trying to go? He said, because I know you're not from around here. I asked him if he'd heard of Henrietta. He smiled and introduced himself as Cootie, Henrietta's first cousin. <laughs> His real name was Hector Henry. People started calling him Cootie when he got polio decades earlier. <laughs> he was never sure why, so he got the Cootie. <laughs> Cootie's skin was light enough to pass for Latinos, so when he got sick at nine years old, a local white doctor snuck him into the nearest hospital saying Cootie was his son, since the hospitals didn't treat black patients. Cootie spent a year inside an iron lung that breathed for him, and he'd been in and out of hospitals ever since. The polio had left him partially paralyzed in his neck and arms with nerve damage that caused constant pain. He wore a scarf regardless of the weather, but the warmth helped ease the pain. I told him why I was there, and he pointed up and down the road. Everybody in Laxtown, Kenny Henrietta. She'd been gone so long, even her memory pretty much dead now, he said. Everything about Henrietta dead except themselves. He pointed to my car. Turn this loud thing off and come inside. I'll fix you some juice. His front door opened into a tiny kitchen with a coffee maker, a vintage toaster, and an old wood stove with two cooking pots on top, one empty, the other filled with chili. He painted the kitchen walls the same dark olive green as the outside and lined them with power strips and fly swatters. He'd recently gotten indoor plumbing but still preferred the outhouse. Though Cootie could barely move his arms, he built the house on his own, teaching himself construction as he went along, hammering the plywood walls and plastering the inside but he'd forgotten to use insulation, so soon after he finished it, he tore down the walls and started over again. A few years after that, the whole place burned down where he fell asleep under an electric blanket, but he built it back up again. The walls were a bit crooked, he said, but he used so many nails he didn't think it could ever fall down. Cootie handed me a glass of red juice and shooed me out the kitchen into his dark wood paneled living room. There was no couch, just a few metal folding chairs and a barber's chair anchored to the linoleum floor, its cushions covered entirely with duct tape. Cootie had been the lax town barber for decades. That chair cost $1,200 now, but I got it for $8 back then, he yelled from the kitchen. Haircut wasn't but a dollar. Sometimes I cut 58 heads in one day. Eventually, he quit because he couldn't hold his arms up long enough to cut. A small boombox leaned against one wall, blaring a gospel call-in show with a preacher screaming something about the Lord curing a caller of hepatitis. Cootie opened a folding chair for me, then walked into his bedroom. He lifted his mattress with one arm, propped it on his head, and began rummaging through piles of paper hidden beneath it. I know I got some information on Henrietta in here somewhere, he mumbled from under the mattress. Where the hell I put that? You know other countries be buying a house for twenty five dollars, sometimes fifty. My family don't get no, none, no money of it, no money out of it. After digging through what looked like hundreds of papers, he came back to the living room. This here the only picture I got of her, he said, pointing to a copy of the Rolling Stone article with the ever-present hand on his photo. I don't know what, what it say. Only education I got, I had to learn on my own, but I always couldn't count, and I can't hardly read or write my name because my hand's so jittery. He asked if the article said anything about her childhood in Clover. I shook my head, no. Everybody like Henrietta she was very good condition everybody liked henrietta because she was a very good conditioned person he said she's just lovey-dovey always smiling always taking care of us when we come to the house even after she got sick she never was a person who say i feel bad and i'm going to take it out on you she wasn't like that even when she was hurting but she didn't seem to understand what was going on she didn't want to think she was going to die he shook his head you know they said if we could get all the pieces of her together she weighed over 800 pounds now he told me 
and Henrietta never was a big girl. She just still growing. In the backyard, in the background, the radio preacher screamed hallelujah over and over as Pootie spoke. She used to take care of me when my polio got bad, he told me. She always did say she wanted to fix it. She couldn't help me because I had, had it before she got sick, but she saw how bad it got. I imagine that's why she used them cells to help get rid of it for other folk, he paused. Nobody around here never understood how she did, and that thing's still living. That's where the mystery's at. He looked around the room, nodding his head towards spaces between the wall and the ceiling where he stuffed dried garlic and onions. You know, a lot of things, they man-made, he told me, dropping his voice to a whisper. You know what I mean by man-made, don't you? I shook my head, no. Voodoo, he whispered. Some people just saying Henrietta's sickness in themselves was man or woman-made. Said Others say it was doctor-made. As he talked, the preacher's voice on the radio grew louder, saying, The Lord, he's going to help you, but you got to call me right now. If my daughter or sister had cancer, I would get on that phone, because time's running out. Cootie yelled over the radio. Doctors say they never heard of another case like Henrietta's. I'm sure it was either man-made or spirit-made, one of the two. Then he told me about spirits in Lacktown that sometimes visited people's houses and caused disease. He said he'd seen a man's spirit in his house, sometimes leaning against the wall by his wood stove, other times by the bed. But the most dangerous spirit, he told me, was the several, several ton headless hog he saw roaming lax town years ago with no tail. Links of broken chain dangled from his blood stained neck, dragging along dirt roads and clanking as it walked. I saw that thing crossing the road to the family cemetery, Cootie told me. That spirit stood right there in the road, its chain swinging and slaying in the breeze. Cootie said it looked at him and stomped his foot, kicking red dust all around his body, getting ready to charge. Just then, a car came barreling down the road with only one headlight. The car came along, shined a light right on it. I swear it was a hog, Cootie said. Then the spirit vanished. I could still hear that chain dragging. Cootie figured that car saved him from getting some new disease. Now, I don't know for sure if a spirit got him rid of or if a doctor did it, Cootie said. But I do know that her cancer wasn't a regular cancer. Because regular cancer don't keep on growing after a person dies. All right, well, that's the end of chapter 10. We're going to pick up chapter 11 another time. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. I hope you have a good rest of y'all day. Peace.